All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is our great pleasure to have for our conjunctures Zoom talks today, our Professor John Caputo, who is the uh, Thomas Watson Professor of Religion Emeritus at Syracuse University and the David Cook Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at Villanova University. Professor John Caputo has been well known as a Heidegger scholar who also contributed to continental philosophy with seminal works in phenomenology, hermeneutics, and deconstruction, especially in dialogue with Jacques Derrida and Jean-Luc Marion. In the past 15 years, his work in philosophy of religion and postmodern Christianity brought about a major theological movement known as weak theology. So it is our great pleasure to have Jack Caputo to give this talk about weak theology in his latest book on cross and cosmos. Jack, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nito. Um, and thank you for the invitation to uh, talk a little bit about this book, which is uh, it's the latest version of an argument that I've been making uh, since, well, I guess since the 2007, The Weakness of God book. And I've made it in, in several different ways. And um, the most recent one, Cross the Cosmos, I, I took uh, a point of departure from um, Luther's Theology of the Cross. Now, that might seem crazy. I mean, you say, well, where, where, does, where does that come from? How does uh, you just sort of pull that out of the air? Well, actually, actually it's, it's not true. It's uh, the, uh, if uh, anyone who's done any work with Heidegger might know that the early Heidegger, the young Heidegger, who started out as a Catholic philosopher and then converted to, Catholicism, to, to Lutheranism after World War I, when he came home from the war, was very deeply influenced by Luther. He was actually establishing himself as something of a Luther scholar uh, in those days. And Bultmann, actually, when, when, when Heidegger went to Marburg, Bultmann actually invited Heidegger in to give some lectures on um, Luther's concept of sin. And um, so Heidegger actually attributes one of his sources, uh, main sources, uh, to Luther's theology of the cross. And um, the res result of that, the, 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 the texts that were directly impacted by the theology of the cross were these early hermeneutics of facticity lectures that Heidegger gave between 1919 and 1922. And as a matter of fact, this is a really interesting uh, Anecdote, it's a little, I guess it's more than an anecdote. The word, Heidegger's German word, destruction, is that actually comes from uh, the Heidelberg disputations, the, the, the Heidegger, uh, the Luther's Heide, uh, the exposition of the theology of the cross. And uh, Luther, Luther is uh, speaking in Latin, he's still a uh, Augustinian friar. He's writing in Latin and he's referring to 1 Corinthians 1 and, and the logos of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1. And he refers to um, Paul's citation of Isaiah in which uh, it says, uh, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. So uh, Luther translates this with the Latin verb, de struere to destroy, destruo. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. So Heidegger picks this up and he begins speaking in, uh, in the Hammerstack, this is the end later on, of course, in time of the destruction, the destruction. So you have this uh, Heidegger's destruction of the metaphysics of presence is proportionately analogous to 
Luther's destruction of the theology of glory, meaning the theology of the cross corresponds to the hermeneutics of facticity. So you got this, and of course, when, when Derrida, who is writing about, the, about the Heidegger, when he comes to this word, this destruction, because he's writing in French, he says, destruction ou déconstruction. It's almost uh, appositional. It says, you know, he wasn't sitting there trying to dream up this word. He was in the middle of a sentence and he comes to the word destruction and he says destruction or deconstruction. Okay, so now you got this continuity from Derrida, from Derrida's French, back to Heidegger's German, back to Luther's Latin, who was translating this, the Septuagint, the Greek, Apollo, who, of course, which is, of course, a translation of the Hebrew. So this word, deconstruction, deconstruction in English, has a, a venerable lineage, so, all the way back to Isaiah, Paul, Luther, Heidegger. Okay. So uh, the whole project of thinking radically um, in Heidegger is, uh, is ultimately coming out of the, the, the uh, theology of glory. And, and, and of course, he writes this, uh, he, gave this he gave this lecture course on Augustine in which he um, tried to deconstruct or destruct, destroy or deconstruct the Neoplatonic theology of glory in the Confessions in order to get back to the practical experience of life in the Confessions, which is this, uh, the core in creatum, this, the, the, the searching heart, who um, uh, is dealing with the, the, the toil and the turmoil and the difficulty of existence. And what put him onto all this, of course, was Kierkegaard. And so when Kierkegaard, you, you take that, that, that famous scene in the concluding unscientific postscript, where Kierkegaard's talking about the, uh, he's, he's sitting in the park, Johannes Climatus, is sitting in Friedrichsburg Garden, thinking everyone else has made the world simpler. The philosophers are writing encyclopedias to make the, to make the world easy. Uh, there are omnibuses and there are steamships and there is this all this emerging technology. Everyone is making the world the, the world uh, life easier. And so he says, the soul, you want to explain what this says, the sole remaining task for me is to make things difficult <laughs> or to, to restore life to its original difficulty. Well, when he's saying that, this is a, this, you know, this is a humorous Kierkegaardian uh, mimicry, uh, it's a mimicry of Hegelian, of course, uh, but but it, it is a very humorous form of the theology of the cross. Because what the theology of the cross is saying, one of the things Luther says in, in the Heidelberg dissertation is that the theolo theologians of glory mistake a good thing for bad and a bad thing for good, and so as they they mistake a good a good thing, which is the difficulty of life, the the the, the, the uh, suffering uh, in, in existence. They mistake that for uh, a bad thing. And uh, prematurely try to en enter the uh, church triumphant, not, not realizing their, their, their duties are back here on earth in the church in um, so the So all of those citizens in Kierkegaard who are constantly uh, describing the difficulties uh, of things, the, ang the anxiety, the fear and the trembling, all of that is Luther. It's all going back to the theology of course, and Heidegger's, Heidegger's picking up. Now, so what, I, what I'm trying to do in Cross and Cosmos is uh, what I call a radical theology of the cross, one, one which sticks to the, to, the, to, the, to the logic, the logos of the cross uh, in a rigorous way, um, in such a way as not, not to allow it to become a, a, a strategy by means of which we bring down the strong. And I think that actually is what happens in Paul. I think when you go from 1 Corinthians 1 to 1 Corinthians 2, it turns out that the, weak, that the weakness and the foolishness of God in 1 Corinthians 1 was ultimately a kind of bait upon which Satan falls 
And then God confirms him by raising Jesus from the dead. And Paul says, had he known that this was the son of God, he would, Satan would have thought twice about, uh, about falling upon him. So I think in, Paul actually it is, it is something of a strategy. I, I also don't want to make it into a, a, an investment of, with long-term rewards where the, we endure the suffering of this world in order to be rewarded in, in another one. Um, and I don't want the, the, the cross to be some kind of a docetism, which we, the weakness and the suffering are merely apparent, which is what happens in high Christology, where it becomes extremely difficult to understand how Jesus, if he's united to the Father in the beatific vision, is, is suffering on the cross. So what I'm saying is, is to stick radically to the, the, to the logos of the cross where the death is not merely appearing, where the foolishness is not really a deeper form of cunning, and um, where the theology of the course is not simply a disguise for a theology, for a hidden theology of the glory, but to stick radically with the, the difficulty of existence, the, 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 fool, the foolishness, the, the suffering, the, the uh, uh, humility of uh, the human condition. And in that, the glory is embedded in in the suffering. It's not the glory doesn't come as a reward for suffering. The, the, um, the, the, the it's, it's it's not a it's, it's not a uh, remuneration for suffering. The glory is embedded in in the suffering in 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 the difficulty itself. So I say that what goes along with a radical theology of cross is a radical theology of glory where the glory is um, embedded in suffering. It doesn't, it, it doesn't come uh, later as, as some kind of reward. And um, I claim that that glory is what, what I call at, at the very end of the book, axiological. That is, Luther, Luther is saying, what is the, the, the theologian, the question is, who is the theologian who is worthy of the name Dig, Digne Dicitur, so the te, Theologus? He doesn't actually say theology of glory. He says theologian of glory, so Theologus. Theologus Digne Dicitur, the theologian, properly speaking, worthy of, worthy of the name, um, is someone who's, who's, who stays radically with the, the logic of the cross. And then the corresponding theology of glory is a glory which comes not as a, as a reward, but as a, um, it's embedded in, in, the, in the suffering, in, in the cross itself. Now, okay, so that's, that's, that's the meaning of the title, Cross and Cosmic. Well, that's, that's the meaning of the subtitle of Theology of Difficult Glory. Now, the interesting thing is that Paul says that the cross has reconciled God to the to the both humanity in particular. So it's liberated us. And more widely, it has affected a cosmic re reconciliation. So it's not simply the reconciliation of God with humanity, it's the reconciliation of God with the cosmos, the entire cosmos. So I say, well, what, what, is, what is that? What, what does that mean? So in the first half of the book, I, could, I, I, could, I take up uh, the question of uh, God's reconciliation of humanity. And in the second half of the book, I turn to the wider question of God's reconciliation of the cosmos. Um, so what I'm claiming is the logic of the cross conceived in this radical way, is a general model for thinking itself. So I'm contrary to Heidegger. Heidegger see, Heidegger says phenomenology, uh, uh, phenomenological ontology, uh, the existential analytic, is the corrective of theology. And I'm saying, no, nah, it's the opposite. The, the task is to take philosophy and its pretensions and submit it to the model, to the theological model of the theology of the cross. So it's not that the philosophers are correcting the theologians by getting their ontological house in order, but that ontology 
is getting humbled by the logic of the cross, which is philosophically or phenomenologically the hermeneutics of facticity. Okay. So, um, it is, and I think in, in the postmodern theory in a, in, a, in a general way is a logic of the cross, which is humbling the uh, pretense, the sort of puffed up pretense of pure reason. So there is a certain crucifixion of the pre pretensions of pure reason. But from my point of view, and this is what I call weak theology, it's also a crucifixion of the pretensions of theology, of particularly of high theology, of strong theology, of supernatural theology. And I want to say theology, in, in the same way that philosophy must be humbled uh, or crucified from its metaphysical pretensions to a uh, hermetic facticity. At the same token, the queen of the sciences theology, the theology which takes itself to have a supernatural providence, which takes itself to be the, the, the theos logos, the word, the word about God, uh, as if it were God's word delivered to it. That has to be humble. So there has to be what Tilly calls a, uh, if we put it in, in Husserlian language, a suspension of the supernatural super signifier. So I think Philosophy needs to be su subject to a suspension of the transcendental signified, as if it had some claim on absolute knowledge. And theology must be, must undergo a suspension of the supernatural attitude, as if it had dropped from the sky, or, the, or as if it was trading in goods that have been, dro that have dropped from the sky. The, the, the real content, I think, of both philosophy and theology is a, a radical hermeneutical uh, fact, uh, a radical hermeneutics of facticity, of, of concrete practical life. And there is an experience of life there that has a validity and integrity of its own, which does not need supernatural backup and does not need a backup in, in, in pure reason. Okay. So that's what I mean by weak theology. A theology that has been weakened from its the supernatural uh, pretension and converted into the coin of, of a hermeneutics of factical experience in the same way that metaphysics has been humbled or crucified or denuded of its uh, metaphysical pretension. Okay, yeah. So then the book, what, what the book does is take the, the two cases of, in, if, if we understand all this, uh, and understand this way, what's, what's, what is God's reconciliation of, with humanity in the cross? And what is God's reconciliation with the world in the cross? Which are the two uh, spheres in which Paul thinks that the, the cross has had, he, he thinks it has not only historical significance, it, is, has, it has cosmic significance. It's just the, whole, the whole universe has been, uh, as he understands it, the, universe. the whole universe has been reconciled to God. Now, my claim is that this is this discourse is hermeneutical, phenomenological, or what I in recent years have been calling theopoetic discourse. So that when you talk about God, you're not talking about a cause, a being. You're talking about um, a a phenomenological uh, event. You're talking about what, what Derrida would call an event. And I um, focus in particular in the first half of the book on, on, on James Cohn's uh, wonderful book on the cross and the lynching tree. And um, he, he's, he, he, he puts the question, he puts my question, the question that I'm trying to put in a really nice way. He says, if the cross has reconciled uh, humanity to God. It has freed us. 
if it has uh, re redeemed us. Why doesn't somebody tell the white people? If, if the cross has made us free, why doesn't somebody tell the white people about that? Now, that, that, that's a, I mean, that's a good rhetorical remark, but it's also it's a little bit funny, but it's also uh, profound, right? Because he's saying, Christ has effected a, a reconciliation, a um, liberation, but it hasn't come accompanied with an emancipation. You can't have liberation without emancipation. You you can't have theology without justice. You can't go around saying Christ has made us free if we're all still in chains. So what has Christ done? The immediate effect of uh, Christianity in the history of the world was not to make things much better. It just the, the, the rich kept on getting rich, richer, and the poor kept on getting poorer. So what is it that Christ did? The three centuries after his death, his own people were scattered to the four winds. The church had consolidated itself into the, uh, into the model that Diocletian laid down for the Roman Empire. It spoke Latin. So the universal Catholic rule of Rome in Latin is what got Jesus killed. It didn't liberate anything. So what did he do? Now, Cohn is still interested in Bart. Cohn wrote his dissertation on Karl Bart. So what I see Cohn saying is, you're just moving your lips. You're just paying lip service if you're talking about theology and you're not out of the streets. That's not liberation. Theology is liberation. And liberation is out in the streets. It's not in a philosophy or a theology seminar. But he also thinks, there will be, uh, and he, he also has an idea of a, of, of a Bartian idea of, of, of eternal salvation. So he does think that there's salvation out there in eternity, but it's not the pie in the sky that should pacify us with the injustice of the present world. So he wants e emancipation and liberation in the present world, and he thinks we'll inhabit in heaven will be one with God too. So, so, so he doesn't he doesn't get rid of the two world theory. He just wants to say that this world is not simply a time of suffering in, in, a, in which we're going to be rewarded in the next. He wants emancipation now, freedom now, and an eternal reward. The and he gets criticized by Dolores Williams, who uh, hits him on two points. He says. First of all, you're talking about men. You're talking about the lynching tree is what happened to the men. Very few women, were, black women were lynched. What the women suffered was not lynching, but what, what, she, what he calls, she calls surrogacy. They were standing in for white, white women to serve, to clean the house and serve as supplementary, su 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 a supplementary sexual purpose. And she says, second of all, the notion that we're going to all go to heaven when this is all over is is uh, a uh, story. What what Jesus is all about is a symbol that God is on the side of the suffering. God, it's a vision. It's a vision. It's not a it's not a historical cause. It's a vision, which is calling us to make justice flow like water in the land. But it's not an historic court. It didn't do anything. If you want something done, we've got to do it. Right? We've got to. Do it. So what is what is the cross? It's a call for us to act, respond, which is saying that the name of God is on the face of the persecutor. It's inscribed on the 
on the forehead of, the, of those who suffer injustice. But it's not a cause that does something. Right? Now that's exactly what I mean by weeping out, that the name of God is the name of a call to which we are supposed to be respond, uh, the response. It's in, in the same way that Bauter Ben Yamin says, if you want to talk about the Messianic age, well, we are the Messianic people. We are the ones the beds have been waiting for. Okay. So what is God? God is the name of a call for justice, not of a, of a metaphysical, not of a historical force. Okay. So it's, a, it's a weak force. It's a, it's a call for justice. And when someone suffers persecution for justice's sake, that's Jesus on the cross. Jesus, Jesus isn't there because his father sent him to take a hit for the rest of humankind. He's there because he, was, he spoke truth to power and they crucified him for it. And he couldn't come down from the cross, cross if he wanted to, as in high Christology. He was being crucified. It was not his idea. And it wasn't God's idea either, unless you think of God as a kind of child abuse. Okay. But it's a figure of profound importance. It's, it's not a Greek idea of God. The notion of a crucified being is not a Greek idea. The Greeks thought that was crazy. The Greeks, when Paul goes, Paul's talking to the Corinthians, right? He's talking to a bunch of Greek intellectuals. And he's giddy in their face. And he's saying, God is on the side of Ta Mayanta. He uses their language, the language of Usia and being. And he says, God is on the side, not of being and presence and form and beauty and being well-educated and well-born. He's on the side of the ill-born, the weak, the foolish, the nobodies, right? So it's, it's a figure of God's solidarity with uh, those who are without power. But it doesn't do anything. Nothing happened. If anything, things got worse. The Roman Empire spread over the, the, the ancient world, and then, the Christian, and then Christianity got converted to the Roman Empire instead of, instead of the other way around. All right, so that, that's the story I worked out in the first half of the book. In the second half of the book, I said, well, how is it that Jesus, how is it that Christ has reconciled the cosmos to God? And uh, you say, well, if you look at, and then in this case, I don't dialogue so much with James Cohn, but with Catherine Keller's Cloud of the Impossible book, uh, in which she works out of a kind of uh, using Nicholas of Cusa uh, and quantum physics. I mean, it's a magisterial work. I mean, she's got. She is so smart. She's got all this stuff in her head. Um, she's got quantum, she's got quantum physics using Karen Barrard, and she knows post-structuralist theory, and she knows feminist theory, and she knows classical Neoplatonism Platonism and, and mystical tradition. Uh, she's got all this, all this stuff in her head. And then she so she she lays out a kind of vision of what she calls cosmic entanglement, in which all things are uh, entangled with one another. So the, the, and then quantum physics is a lot of really interesting things. Entanglement, of course, is the word in. But then I raise the question, I say, well, okay, but you know, if you actually look at what these what these physicists are saying, most of them think right now, it's not, they're not the only people, it's not the only view out there, but the dominant view, the received view is that the universe is expanding into oblivion. And uh, the, someone said, the first 15 billion years or so of the history of the universe has been interesting. But after that, it's just going to get very boring. It's just going to spread out into, into pure nothingness. And each, all things are moving apart from each other in, in an increasingly accelerating uh, rate. Until they finally just everything, the most minute particles of uh, uh, subatomic particles will break down. And at the very end, they'll be just inert, dissipated energy, useless energy, nothing, cold, dark death. So in one sense, has God reconciled the universe to himself? I mean, Paul didn't know anything about that, right? He thought the end of the universe was Spain. But he says God reconciled the cosmos to himself. What the, so what does that mean if you say, well, look, I mean, the... the in the same way that nobody told the white people that Jesus freed 
has freed all humankind. In the same way, the cosmos is, you know, it's uh, not being reconciled by Christ in any literal way. It's, it's actually heading, heading for dissipation. And this earth is in a terrible mess. It's, in, it's, li it's literally in hot water. Right? Um, and I say, well, again, the, the Christ was, is not a causal power in the same way that he wasn't an historical power that stopped evil in its tracks and made all men free. So by the, by the same token, it, Christ is not a, a cosmic power who's going to put an end to carbon pollution and uh, uh, global over global heating and stop the expansion of the universe, command it to stop the way he commanded the sun to stop uh, Joshua. So, you know, that, you're, you're thinking about God myth mythologically. So wh what's, in what sense is there a reconciliation? The reconciliation, I think the reconciliation is again, to, to look death in the eye, to look mortality and suffering and quality of life in the eye and to see in, in the universe itself, um, this moment, to what the way Heidegger says, when we, when we, when we face death front, front, front on, we appreciate the, the singularity and uniqueness of our existence. In the same way, I think that, that death makes life itself precious. And I think that's true on a, on a cosmic level. But what, what we've got here, is this moment, in, in a sense, and they put it in Hegelian terms, in which the absolute becomes conscious of itself, in which the universe has evolved into a state where consciousness has emerged as an, as an emergent property, and for one brief shining moment, cosmically speaking, the universe can say, Amen, Alleluia. Yes, yes. There it is. Says Vienna. Yes, we win. This is the moment uh, where where life uh, takes on a, a fleeting, fragile glory. Cosmically speaking, and then it will move on. And maybe this has happened time and time again throughout the multiple galaxies uh, that you know are beyond our comprehension that we'll never know anything about. Maybe one of those, when you look up at the sun, the astronomers tell us, when you look up at the stars at night, where sometimes we're seeing the stars, the light of stars that are long since dead. Well, how about in a galaxy far, far away, people that we can't even imagine, intelligent beings that we can't even imagine look up, and they see the light of a star that is long since dead, and that star is us. Our, our star. Right? Would you would you say their life is meaningless? That the life of the people in this forgotten uh, in this forgotten world is meaningless? No, it was uh, it, it it was a precious moment of cosmic glory, a difficult glory because it's fragile and disappears. So the so so the name of God is not the name of an historical power or of a uh, ontological cosmic cosmological power what is it it's the name of something i say at, at the end it's the name of an axiological it's not theological or ontological but axiological it is uh, a name in which we catch sight of the in the worthiness uh, of all things and the ta our, our task as human beings the, the worth of all things and our task as, you, as, as human beings is to make ourselves worthy of the things that happen to us, make ourselves worthy of the events that happen to us, which is the way that the leaders put it. Ethics is making yourself worthy of what happens to you, of the events that happen to you. And so, so the, the name of God is also to be an axiological one. It's the name of a call in which we make ourselves worthy of um, the gift that has been given to us. And then uh, we all disappear. All right, so that, no, no, I don't have a long left, but that, that's the, uh, the gist of it. That's the gist of the idea.
So it's just another way of arguing for the weakness of God. I argue for the weakness of God in a book called The Weakness of God. I argue again in a book called The Insistence of God. And then I argue for again in a book called The Folly of God. So this one, here's another way of arguing for it from the logic of the book. Period. Thank you so much, yes. Professor Caputo, for this brilliant, insightful talk. I have one question here. In your book, Cross and Cosmos, your takes on Paul's theology of the cross as weakness and foolishness from the first epistle to the Corinthians are combined with Martin Luther's theology of the cross as opposed to a theology of glory. Now, how would you respond to conservatives, and especially evangelical fundamentalists, who complain that you are throwing the baby out with the bathwater as you lose sight of Jesus' resurrection and of his glorious second coming? Well, I think that the, resur the resurrection and the second coming are belong to a theo, what I would call theopoetic. That is, I don't think that they should, I don't think those things should be reified. I think they should be um, taken not as supernatural events, but as uh, phenomenological ones. That is, um, let me put it this way. Uh, it, it may, Thomas Jefferson, the, 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 the fundamentalists like to think that this is a Christian country and that all of the founding fathers all, all went to church on Sunday and they were good Christians. They, they were deists, right? They were deists. So Thomas Jefferson has a copy of the New Testament. What's he do with it? He takes it and he cuts out all the miracle stories, right? And then he gives you this guy who's basically Socrates, you know? He's a good guy. He tells the truth and he gets, takes a hit for telling the truth. And well, we don't need Jesus for that, right? We already had Socrates. Um, now, question would be, so that's, that's what happens to Jesus when you put him in, uh, submit him to a rational. Uh, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche has this thing that, that, that there are quotes where he says, he says, he, he says, the knight of reason, you know, the, the man of reason, he says, a big, He's a, he's a knight walking around with all this armor on and he's clank, 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 clank. And he's completely outdone by the finesse of a beautiful woman. So he says, suppose, suppose truth were a woman. He said, then the knight of faith would land on the ground and would be trying to get him up again because he's clank, clank, clank. He, he doesn't understand anything unless it's a logical argument. Right? Well, Thomas and Jefferson is, Jefferson is like that with, when he reads the New Testament. So suppose we gave Thomas Jefferson a copy of Macbeth. Would he have cut out all the stories about the ghost? You know, to get to the pure ethics in, the, in, in Macbeth? It's a story, right? So the rationalists don't know how to read the story because they, 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 it looks like it's crazy. It looks like it's superstition. And fundamentalists don't know how to read the story because they reify it. They literalize it. It's a story. And stories are profoundly important. They tell us things. Plato says you get so far using your head, and then you hit a wall, and then you have to start telling stories. Ricardo says myths are stories that give us something to think about. Schelling's Refutation, Schelling's argument against Hegel was what he called das Unvordenkliche, the thing that thinking can't get there in time to catch before being has it. Being comes first. And thinking is always too late to arrive on the scene. Thinking can't get there ahead of being. If thinking says this can't be, being says, and yet here we are. So there's something that thinking just can't reach. So what do we do in that situation? We tell stories. So he has this philosophy of, revelation, uh, of, of mythology, which is where, where we make contact with the ground of being in story. So fundamentalists are reifying stories. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to read. And rationalists are also reifying stories and then dismissing them as superstition. Their fundamentalists believe them and reify them. And the, and the rationalists um, 
also think that they mean to be taken literally and think they're crazy. So I don't have to deal with fundamentalists, fortunately, because first of all, I'm a philosopher, not a pastor. And second of all, I'm retired. So it's, it's, not, it's ultimately not my problem to deal with fundamentalists. But that's the answer that if you could get them to listen to you, that's the answer. It's, it's a theopoetics. It's not a history book. Thank you so much. There is another question here. This is my own question. I counted over 40 occurrences of a liberation in your book, which really, of course, pleased me a lot, as I recall your serious interest and commitment to Latin American liberation theology since the 80s, as well as to feminist and Black theology. I still recall that Jim Cohn, whom you quote a lot in your book, came to Villanova campus once and gave a radical talk challenging students to make sense of structural racism in US society. Now, how would you see the response of a public political theology to normative claims of ongoing social movements today, such as Black Lives Matter? I would say right on. <laughs> There, I mean, there. That, that's Cohen's point. Cohen, Cohen has almost an, an impatience with with academics. I mean, he's a professional academic. I mean, he writes books. He's, he's a he, he was a professor of theology, but he has a kind of impatience with uh, academics you know, unless they're out in the streets, and uh, he thinks it's just talk. And that's clear. I mean, I think that I like to use the expression. Uh, sometimes use the expression radical theology, and I think radical theology involves, involves rad, ra, these ra, radical political uh, visions, things, which are, are radical in the sense that they're uh, go, going back to the roots of, of, of justice. I mean, the, 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 the problem, I think part of the problem in, in uh, it's, I mean, apart from the United States and Western Europe, I don't know, I can't speak for, for Latin America. But part of the problem is that we've just simply given religion over to, uh, to the right. And we've given patriotism over to the right also, which is probably a mistake. Uh, because the, believing in your country is not believing in a, a geopolitical entity. It's believing in its idea, what it stands for. Uh, Rorty, Rorty wrote a book called Achieving Our Country, where he meant that not it wasn't MAGA, make America great again. It was make make America faithful to its to its ideals, and um, uh, so I think both both uh, patriotism and um, religion are forces. The, the the right response to 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 right wing politics right now is not a sneering secularist critique. It's liberation theology. It's it's a it's a it's a progressive, emancipatory version of religion, and you know you see this perfectly in uh, someone like Martin Luther King, who mobilized the the, the Southern Baptist Church, uh, along in in the civil rights movement, uh, in the name of making America great. Truly, you know, without the without the Nazi slogan, make America great again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, religion and, and, and podeo et patria should be a left-wing slogan. And it should mean let justice flow like land, like, like water over the land. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's all one thing. Uh, it's a seamless climate. Thank you, Professor Caputo. Another question here from Professor Bavarescu. Professor Caputo, how do you face the problem of evil in the world within a theology of the cross? Well, on one level, if we're just talking philosophy, it's, it's not that hard, right? And we can, the theology of the cross is the, uh, I take it to be a theology of the solidarity of God with the victim, 
it's not a, I mean, you know, it, when I was doing this work, I, I, I spent a certain amount of time studying the history of the theology of the cross. And it's really very clear that Anselm is, um, is an innovator who's who's altering the, the existing tradition that nobody really held what Anselm held uh, before the 11th century. Before the 11th century, the dominant interpretation of the cross was what they called the Christus Victor uh, notion that Gustav Alain years ago wrote this book about Christus Victor. That it was about Jesus had been sent into the world on behalf uh, to announce the, the, the coming reign of God in a combat between the demonic forces, the powers and the principalities, and the, the forces of God, the kingdom of God. He was announcing that, that God was coming and he was uh, slain by the powers of darkness and then God rose him up, raised him, raised him up. Nothing about satisfaction theory. There was no satisfaction theory. It was, it was a theory of the strife between good and evil, you know, between right, right and wrong. And Jesus was the figure of identification, God's identification with uh, the victims of the powers, the powers of this world. Nothing about the satisfaction theory. Um, so, so the cross doesn't mean that God's paying it, that we'll be, the God man theory. Anselm's interesting, you know, he's, he's a great theologian who is who made the two most influential errors in the history of theology. The one was to introduce the satisfaction theory into Christology, and the other was to introduce the ontological argument into philosophy. Both of them are wrong, and, and each one of them is enormously influential. He's, he's the author of the greatest mistakes in the history of theology. He is the most influential theologian ever. You know, he's, he, he influenced everything thereafter badly. Um, so, so intellectually in the seminar, God's, it's perfectly clear that the name of God, that the cross is the figure of God's solidarity with the victims of, of, the, of the powers of this world. Yeah, that's, that's easy, I think. The other half of your question, I don't know what to do with it. How, how do you how do you get this into rural America? Uh, there, Jesus. You want know who there, Jesus is? There, Jesus packs a gun, and, and he, he's the apocalyptic Jesus. He's riding a white horse with a sword in his mouth. He's he, their favorite text is the kingdom of God suffer, suffers violence, and only the violent will win it. That's their Jesus. How do you talk them out of that? How do you get to them? I, I don't know. I have no idea how to do it. It's also <laughs> really not my problem. I'm <laughs> I am 81 years old and I'm not a pastor and I don't have to deal with evangelical Christians. But I, I don't know how or what. I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the verge of despair about, about this. I mean, they're trying to wreck American public schools right now. They're trying to wreck the electoral system. It, it's it's crazy. So what the, the Supreme Court is overrun with, with seven right-wing Catholics. I, I have no idea how you fix that. I, I mean, just keep keep on keeping on and hope that we catch a break. But the theological side of it is easy. I mean, as you, can, you, can, you, you get your books out, you get the text out, you look them up, you check the Greek words, and you, and you can settle these things. But to to actually change the hearts and minds and to, and to see into them. You know, Gadamer says, you know, when somebody looks like they're crazy, you, what you gotta do is try assume they're not crazy and try to figure out why they're saying what they're saying. Well, that's a really hard, I mean, that's great hermeneutic advice, but that's really hard to do with conspiracy theorists and, and right-wing evangelical gun-toting uh, Christians. Christian evangelicals. This woman uh, uh, teaches at Calvin College named Kristen Dumez just wrote a book called Jesus and John Wayne. <laughs> and she says they really think John Wayne was a figure and they think too, they think Trump was a, the anointed one. And they really think Jesus was you know, a, a liberal individual gun coding you know, individualist uh, you know, self-reliant 
fighter. <laughs> hey, thank, you very, thank you very much, Professor Caputo. Uh, I have another question here. At some point, you said in your book that your Yeshua, like your Kierkegaard, is closer to Paul Tillich's interpretation of dialectical theology than to Karl Barth's. Now, how would you relate your conception of the unconditional to the social reality of the concrete other, say, of the poor and the outcast in today's society, even more specifically, Black women, as Dolores Williams suggests? Yeah, well, in, in that argument between Williams and, uh, and Cohen, I think Williams has got the better part of the argument and, and, and with it. And so liberation theology is almost a square of opposition with liberation theology. You got white male Frankfurt liberation theology, and then you have black male liberation theology in Cohen, and then you have white women liberation theology, and then you have black women. Theological. So what you want to do is get yourself in the middle where all those things converge, and you got it. You got it all. Um, uh, Tilly, of course, was a hero in 1933, and then when he got to the United States, he was an intellectual hero for a lot of people in the, in the United States. But but he was quite, as Cohn says, he was quite blind to uh, racism. And then he was quite blind. He was more than just blind about, about patriarchy. I mean, he was a womanizer. And his, of course, Hannah wrote this famous book about, after he died, about his, 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 his extramarital exploits. But, you know, Cohn, who, was, who criticized him for never addressing racism, Martin Luther King wrote his disserta dissertation on, on Tillich, and, and Cohn makes great use of, of Tillich. So, so Cohn says the power to be, the courage to be, is the courage to be black. And Mary Daly was in those classes that that that, Cohn, that Tillich was given at Harvard. She was auditing those classes, um, and she says the courage to be uh, the, the courage to be is the courage to be a woman in the face of patriarchy. And um, so there is a, and then she says the God beyond God in Tillich is the God beyond God the Father. Her first first major book, Beyond God the Father, was the takeoff on, the, on an expression from Tillich. So Tillich could be used to purposes that he himself did not envisage. When he came to the United States, he, 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 he uh, continued his, his um, uh, tremendous uh, explorations in theology in panentheism, but he became somewhat uh, politically insensitive. You know, he, he, he was on the ball. He was a, in Frankfurt when, when he lost his job. He, and he had just written that book about the Nazis, about Christian socialism, and got kicked, lost his job, and then came to the United States. So he, was a, he was a very profoundly uh, involved political figure in German theology when he was in Germany. But in the United States, not so much. But Cohen and Daly both take their point of departure, take part of their point of departure from Tillich. So it can be done. Tillich didn't do it. But he, it can be done with this work. Well, thank you very much. Another question here. Um, let me see. Okay, uh, Hans Kung's book on Hegel's Christology has been widely regarded as an important token of the indebtedness of liberation theology to Hegel, as supported by German theologians Pannenberg, Metz, and Moltmann. So would you say that your theology of the cross recasts the Christology of reconciliation of both human nature in the cosmological within weak theology itself? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. I, the, the, I've been using, in the, I have another book coming out shortly 
uh, in which I've been using uh, uh, shelling rather than more so than Hegel, or Schelling's critique of Hegel along with Hegel. Uh, because of my, I, I would be happy to describe my own view as a kind of Hegel. I, I described it once as Hegelianism, head, a headless Hegelianism. You know, Hegel without the concept, without the begriff. Uh, which is because I think that what Hegel says about religion is, is right, that it's a Vorstellung. It's, a, it's an imaginative figuration, which is visceral, which is, uh, gets us in our bowels, and it's there. It's there uh, before it gets to the level of a concept. And the, the only problem with what he's saying, I think, is that he thinks that it does get to the level of a concept, that you, that you can transcend it. He thinks that philosophy can transcend religion and art with thought. And I don't think that's possible. And that's showing critique of it, right? Thinking can't transcend. Being is the un for Denklischer. So it can't be transcended by Denken. It's un for Denklischer. And it, um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't have any contact with it. And that contact is coming from religion and art because there we're, we're sort of bound up with being before thinking gets on the scene. And uh, it shows up in religious and artistic creation. So, yeah, I mean, what I, I, what I think of uh, Hegel and, and Schelling uh, were uh, uh, transformative figures you know, who, who basically broke the grit of classical theological transcendence, the notion of a supreme being, the thing that we all had to learn. I don't know if you had a you had to do this when you were in grade school. I went to a Catholic school. We had to memorize the catechism. And the first thing you memorize is that God is supreme being created the, created the heaven and earth and made us to know him and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. I remember that very well because if I, if I got it wrong, I'd get whacked. And Hegel broke the grip of that. And he said, that's, a, that's, that's God as an alien power. And, and shall we, both. So I think of myself as some kind of, some kind of heterodox Hegelian, Schillingian Hegelian. German idealism is, I, I think, a transformative movement. Thank you so much, Jack. We, we are approaching the end. There is one final question. Okay. I was very curious to hear what you have to say uh, in terms of relating your own uh, weak theology to uh, Tom Altizer's theology of the death of God. Yeah, he, Tom, I love Tom, and he, he's, a, he's a groundbreaker, right? He was, he was somebody who really did, he shook the trees. <laughs> he got everybody rattled up. And he's a lovely, lovely man and fun and uh, rabble rouser and got in the face of orthodoxy and all that, all that, love that. But I think it's more Nietzsche than, than Hegel. I think what he's talking about is more Nietzsche than Hegel. I don't think of myself as the death of God theologian in Tom's um, uh, tradition. I think of myself as a, uh, a theologian of the event is, uh, is taking place in the name of God, not of the death of God. Uh, he, he was reading the death of God in Hegel through the eyes of Nietzsche. And to that extent, I think it, it's, more, it's more Nietzsche than, than, than uh, Hegel. For Hegel, the death of God is a moment in God's life. And um, it's a phase, it's an important phase, but it's a movement, a moment. Everything's in process. Things don't have a meaning in Hegel, they have a, a history. And the death of God is part of the moment in that history, part of the God becoming God. It wasn't the death of God is part of the, is the way that God becomes God, the, the genuine, authentic uh, Geist. The, the, but the Geist can't give up its spirit. You know? The spirit doesn't expire. And hey, oh, that doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. 
the, the death of God is a, is a moment of breakdown of, of particularity and, and a transition to something richer in both. I, I actually, you know what I was thinking? Uh, I, I think that uh, the notion of kenosis is a bad idea. It's not that God uh, is a plenitude who empties himself into the world, but that God is an emptiness who needs the world to fill himself. So you should think not of canonic uh, theology, but a pleromotic theology, that, that uh, God's entrance into the world is, is God acquiring a body. And he, you know, he comes into the world and he feels his limbs and he stretches out and he, all of a sudden he's embodied, you know, he's, he's whereas the Anzish is, is empty and so, alone is like Aristotle's self-thinking thought. It's a solitude. So it's, a, it's an emptiness which is seeking fulfillment. So he's not a, 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 a pleroma who's emptying himself. He's an emptiness who's fulfilling himself. So God's not, God doesn't die. In it. I mean, that's not the, that's not the main point in, in Hegel. That's because of, it, it is in Nietzsche. But that all being said, I love Tom. Tom Altizer is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Caputo. Yes, I recall very well Professor Altizer at uh, Stony Brook. He was uh, teaching there uh, in the literary studies, a uh, complete actually. And he did a great, uh, interesting rapprochement between his uh, Nietzschean theology of the death of God in uh, William Blake's uh, right. writing. Blake, Blake and Dante. Blake and Dante, Blake and Dante uh, right. You thought the great Catholic theologian was Dante? Yeah. The great Protestant theologian was Blake. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Dante. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, I have to run. I, I, yes. I got a late start, and that's my fault. I have to run. Yes. Next, how about next, next week we get together? Yes, we'll catch up a with minutes, you uh, a couple minutes next ahead of time. So that Friday, I'm sure I'm on yeah, the yeah. Let's start at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And once again, thank you very much, Professor Caputo, for this brilliant talk and for the instigating discussion. It was excellent to see you again. Take it's care and have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.